Our next speaker is Dr. Dean Pearson. Dr. Pearson is a research ecologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, USDA Forest Service, where he has worked for the past 14 years. He is a team leader for the Rocky Mountain Research Station Invasive Species Working Group and the Wildlife Ecology Unit's Invasive, Invasive Species Research Team. Dr. Pearson. Thanks, Darren. And thanks uh, to the organizing committee for putting this show on and uh, having me come and join in. I'm going to change things up a little bit, I guess. I'm not going to talk about sagebrush. Uh, I'm going to talk about ecology and management of invasive species. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a program of research that myself and my colleague Yvette Ortega have developed over the last uh, seven or eight years at the Rocky Mountain Research Station in Missoula, Montana. And in taking on this sort of ominous uh, problem, what we've done is we've developed a conceptual framework for thinking about this. We're sort of framing our thoughts in terms of what, what it is, you know, trying to understand what it is that happens when these exotic species come into a system, what are the impacts that they have, how do they change the system, and then what happens when we throw our management tools into the fray. So not only how do they affect the target species, but also how do they affect the system as a whole, because we're really trying to manage the whole system. And this has been pretty helpful to us in terms of thinking about this problem. And so my hope today is to introduce you to this framework and maybe give you some different perspectives on thinking about these issues and uh, the struggles that we're up against here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to this conceptual framework. I'm going to walk through this uh, and basically decompose this thing and walk you through it. And I'm going to illustrate some of these concepts with some of the uh, uh, specific studies that we've done uh, in the context of this framework. Okay, so let's start with a native system. You can pick your favorite, grasslands, forests, shrub, sagebrush, uh, habitats, whatever. Native systems exist in an equilibrium state, right? Now, it's a dynamic equilibrium state. We have uh, disturbance processes. We have fire, wind throw, floods, things like this that come in. They push the system off of that equilibrium point. But almost immediately through processes of succession, the system starts to move back towards that equilibrium point. So it's dynamic, but we have some predictability to the system, and it stays in this sort of basin of attraction. And this predictability is pretty important in terms of management when you think about this. Now, when exotic species come into a system, something very different happens. When an exotic organism enters into a system, it fundamentally changes that system. Now, it can change that system a little, or it can change it a lot, depending upon the nature of the invader. We have various mild-mannered sort of weak invaders that come into a system. We don't really notice a change, or we don't perceive it as humans. On the other hand, we have other invaders like spotted napoli, Dalmatian toad flax, cheatgrass, and so forth that come into a system, and they pretty severely alter the system. It's pretty obvious that the system has, has changed. And what they do is they knock it out of that basin of attraction that it was in before, and they launch it onto an invasion trajectory. All right? They start moving the system away from that zone. Now, ecological theory says that the system will find a new basin of attraction. There'll, there'll be a new equilibrium st uh, state that will happen. But this could take tens or hundreds or even thousands of years. So it's really important to recognize that we have this moving target now, that the system is moving. Uh, and in the words of Dorothy, I think she probably put it best, we're not in Kansas anymore. When these things come in a system, we're really not in Kansas anymore, and we've got these trajectories launched. All right, so it's important to recognize this first off, and secondly, it's important to know what's going on to try and understand and predict where the system is going. Because if you think about this from a management perspective, this is our no-action alternative, right? So if we do nothing in the face of invasion, this is where the system's going to go. And in some cases, we may choose uh, to do nothing. In the case of mild-mannered invaders, not a big deal, let it go there. Uh, in other cases, we may not have much power to change things, so we may, we may have to go with this. But we, we certainly want to know where the system's going. Finally, when we want to change, when we want to do some management in here, this is our baseline for measuring what we're trying to do for how effective our management is. Now, in the case of invasive species management, we have some powerful tools that we can use. We have things like herbicides and biological controls. All right, this is just a few of the tools that we have. But these are two of the more powerful and two of the more commonly used tools that we have. So I'm going to focus on these two. All right, these are powerful tools. They can alter this invasion trajectory. But what they're not is these things aren't ruby slippers. Okay? You can't just click your heels or throw these tools out on the system and expect that you're going to get back to Kansas because you're not. Maybe you get to Nebraska or Arkansas, which, you know, I'm from the mountains, so. Um, but that's probably a lot better than where you might end up, hopefully. And there are several reasons for this, but one of the key reasons is that these, these tools fundamentally do not, uh, it's very rare that when they do, they fundamentally do not extirpate the exotic species from the system, uh, at least not on mainland systems. And so you still have the exotic in there. It's still pushing you out of that equilibrium state and it's still pushing you onto that trajectory. You're trying to either beat it back or alter that trajectory, basically. So what happens is you end up with a system where you have the, uh, the invaders in the system. 
But now you have it with the herbicide or the biocontrol or some other management tool or some combination thereof. All right, the key here is, of course, that you've improved the situation. All right, ideally, when we put this management into the system, we want to improve the situation. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and there are several reasons, again, for that. But the primary reason is that all management tools have side effects. All right? And with those side effects, you can actually make things worse, even if you suppress the target species. If you think about this, this is really very much like human medicine, right? We have a complex organism. It has an ailment. We have various management tools. We have things like surgeries. Uh, we have uh, uh, drugs and so forth. But they all have side effects. And the key to being successful uh, in human medicine is matching up the, the drug or the treatment uh, given the ailment so that we do the best overall for the patient. Say, for instance, if we have a, we have a potentially terminal cancer patient uh, and we have a, t a drug over here that can potentially uh, uh, improve the situation for that patient, but it has a side effect such as liver failure. All right, we might use that tool in any case and we may actually improve the situation for that patient, even though it has a pretty se severe side effect. However, in another situation, we may have some uh, patient that has an acne problem. All right, we have a tool that can actually improve the situation for the acne problem. But again, liver failure is a potential side effect. So in this case, we may be able to improve the situation, but we may also kill the patient, so you know, not necessarily uh, what we want to do. Okay, so it's really the same when we're managing uh, these problems, all right? We have management tools, they have side effects. We need to understand the ailment of the system, all right, the invasion trajectory, where the system is going, and understand the tools uh, in the context of that to, to try and do the best to make sure that we improve upon uh, the scenario here. Uh, what we don't want to do is we don't want to get into a situation where 10 years down the road we realize, oh my gosh, we made things worse. We spent a lot of time, effort, and money, and things are worse than they were before. We need to, we need to understand these, we need to have the understandings up front to make good management decisions. And so my job as a, a scientist for the Forest Service is to actually uh, provide the information, do the R&D, the research and development, to help understand the system, to understand the tools and their side effects, their strengths and their weaknesses, and then get that information to the managers, hopefully uh, doing that in part today, so that the managers can then use those tools to make the most uh, effective decisions possible. All right, so there's really two, I have two intents with this conceptual framework. One is to think about the problem and what we're up against. Uh, and the other is to think a little bit about what has to happen between R&D, research, and management to make this all come together and work out. Now, if we do this, it uh, doesn't mean we won't make any more mistakes. No, we're going to still make mistakes. We still make mistakes in human medicine, and we spend a heck of a lot more money in research in human medicine than we do in these systems. And these systems are a lot more complex. But we can, I think, with this sort of a framework, do a much better job than we do um, currently. In fact, with the tools that we currently have, I think we can do better management right now. But certainly, we can start thinking into the future uh, in terms of the next step in developing our tools uh, and do a better job overall. Okay, so that's the conceptual framework. Now what I want to do is I want to walk through and, and provide some, some sort of real world data examples uh, to illustrate these concepts. And as you all know by now, we need to start with this invasion trajectory because we need to understand this trajectory in order to evaluate our management. Okay, so these concepts apply in general to pretty much any system, I would argue, and any exotic invader. But the system I'm working in is uh, Intermountain Palouse uh, Grasslands. So this covers a wide region of the Intermountain Zone, leaks out into the uh, eastern part of Oregon and Washington. And this is a photograph showing what that system looked like in the early 1970s. This is a photograph taken of the hillsides of Missoula, around Missoula, Montana, where I'm from. And this is what the system looks like today. All right, so this is what I mean when I'm saying we're not in Kansas anymore that we've launched an invasion trajectory. This system is very different than it was before. And in fact, it has not achieved an equilibrium state at this current time. Uh, it's not clear exactly where the system is going to go, but it is clear that we need to understand this. If we're gonna try and mitigate impacts in here, we need to know what are these, these impacts. It's very rare that we actually quantify um, what the changes are in these systems. All right, clearly the vegetation community has been impacted in a, in a severe way, but are all species equally affected? Are some groups more at risk than others? What is the trajectory of the system? And how does this affect higher trophic levels? We rarely look at that either. So certainly, in terms of habitat and food resources, we're going to impact higher trophic levels as well. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to walk through the, the invasion trajectory, give you a sense of the invasion tra trajectory for spotted napoli. All right, and we'll start at the bottom of the food chain. We'll start with the plants. Okay, so what we're looking at here is uh, on the y-axis we have uh, percent cover of native species. On the x-axis we have percent cover of spotted napweed. 
And so you can think about this, you can think of this moving left to right on this as sort of a time series in terms of how uh, abundance of spotted knapweed affects these native species. The top line here is all native species, all right? Pretty severe decline here. Um, and this is really just reflecting what we saw in that photo before, right? So not particularly uh, informative. The real question here is, are all species or are all functional groups equally impacted? And the answer is no, they're not. The next line down here is uh, perennial forbs, and that's a pretty steep decline for the perennial forbs. Uh, the next line after that here is uh, perennial grasses. Significant decline as well, not as steep as perennial forbs. Uh, and then annual forbs down here you see uh, seem to be pretty much impervious. Out to 60% napoli cover, they don't really seem to show any response. So if we think about this moving from left to right on this, we have a sense now of the invasion trajectory in this system in terms of these different functional groups. All right, so perennial forbs are going out the fastest. Um, forbs make up 80% uh, or more of the species richness in these systems on average. Uh, most of those are actually per perennial forbs. Grasses are going down as well at a, at a significant rate. They're a major biomass, major primary productivity source in this system. So these are some pretty serious impacts. Obviously, these changes, these shifts that we're seeing in these vegetation communities have implications for wildlife as well. Uh, the, the plant in the foreground here, the yellow plant, is arrowleaf balsam root, balsamariza sagittata, and this is our poster plant for this system. It's a dominant plant where it occurs off in the system, biomass-wise, and it's pretty common throughout these systems. Now, it's in the aster family, it's in the sunflower family. It makes big seeds, they taste like sunflower seeds. Lots of birds and rodents eat them, insects as well. Uh, large herbivores will eat these plants as they're popping out in the spring. Um, insects eat the plants, uh, it's habitat for birds and rodents, etc. This particular species is affected most, um, but in general, these forbs are uh, feeling these impacts. So let's talk about the higher trophic level effects uh, briefly. All right, so this is a chipping sparrow. This is a migratory songbird. It comes to our systems to make babies, to recruit into its population. So that's a pretty important um, um, outcome when it comes here. Now these guys are interesting uh, as a study species in that they nest in, they live in savanna habitats, so uh, uh, grasslands sparsely dotted with trees. They nest in these trees. And so we know that spotted napweed invasion doesn't affect the nest sites directly, right? However, they forage on the ground. And what we've documented in this system, or Ortega et al. have documented in the system, looks something like this. So chipping sparrows rely heavily on invertebrate species when they're breeding, nesting, and rearing their young. In particular, important groups like lepidopterans and orthopterans, so uh, butterflies and uh, moths, uh, grasshoppers and crickets, as well as other groups. These, in turn, um, depend heavily on the native vegetation. In fact, lepidopterans commonly have species or genus-specific relationships with plants. So what we're seeing in the system is as spotted napweed comes in and displaces the native plants, um, uh, this study documents declines in important invertebrate groups as a result of this. Uh, as well, we're seeing declines or, or reductions, significant reductions in reproduction of chipping sparrows or recruitment of chipping sparrows uh, in the invaded habitats, right? And, and as well as some other indicators that these guys are not doing very well. All right, so from this, from this study, I can tell you that uh, spotted napweed can affect wildlife species can affect chipping, chipping sparrows. In particular, we've shown that. All right, the more important conclusion, however, is not that. It's, it's understanding general process here, all right? Um, if we get into a situation where we have to study the response of every single native species to every single exotic invader, we are never going to get ahead of this game. We need to use community ecology as much as we can to try and understand general process, be able to generalize these processes so we can understand what's being, what are the impacts, uh, what is it that we need to mitigate, and how do we go about mitigating that. In this case, spotted napwood is reducing important invertebrate groups because of displacement of native plants. Now, leafy spurge and toad flax, I'm pretty sure, are going to do very similar things. Okay, so you can generalize this to some extent. Uh, as well, those invertebrate groups that are disappearing are particularly important groups for insectivorous species, not just chipping sparrows, but other insectivorous songbirds, as well as rodents uh, and herps, etc. So generalizing and understanding how these things, uh, what are the impacts in the system in general, how are they happening, in this case, erosion of native food chains, um, so that we can then go in and mitigate those specific impacts is extremely important. All right, so that's a, that's a, a taste of the impacts of spotted napweed in this system. Obviously, it has much more impacts than that. It's much more complicated than that. But you get a sense now that it has pretty serious impacts on the native vegetation, uh, as well as uh, ramifications for higher trophic levels. So given that, we may want to manage here uh, and do something to try and deal with this problem. So let's talk about uh, our management tools. 
Now we've done a bunch of work on biocontrols and herbicides here, but I don't have time to talk about the biocontrols, so we're just going to talk about herbicides. All right, so as you can see from this photo, spotted knapweed, as it turns out, is fairly sensitive to broadleaf herbicides. And this is a good thing, because broadleaf herbicides affect um, forbs, broadleaf plants, and not grasses, right? But with regard to the broadleaf plants, the way that you reduce non-target effects or impacts on non-target species is a function of the, the sensitivity of the different forbs to the herbicide. So if we have a target species that's particularly sensitive, as in this case, we can use relatively low doses of relatively mild herbicides to minimize those side effects. Now that's not the case for all of these nasty weeds coming in. Uh, uh, spurge, toad flax, you have to be much more aggressive and so you're gonna have much stronger side effects. All right, but in the case of spotted knapweed, you can pretty much take out a stand of spotted knapweed, 90% um, or more of the individuals with a single application. And so this is, so this is pretty effective, this is pretty impressive. Now it'll come back in from the seed bank, and in three to five years you'll have to go back in uh, and treat again. Um, but you can manage the species in this way, and because of its high sensitivity, you can minimize side effects. However, you can't completely get away from side effects. So this is early balsam root again. And this is what it looks like after a tordon treatment for spotted knapweed. You can see some old spotted knapweed stems um, showing up in here. Now I can tell you that in about three years' time, you won't be able to tell that these plants have been treated. Right? These, these adult plants recover from this. However, the seedlings don't. The seedlings are completely taken out. First and second year cohorts are completely taken out, and perhaps more cohorts than that. In addition to this, these guys don't flower for the first uh, couple of years, and when they do flower, they don't set seed very well. So it can take three or more years before they recover in terms of seed set. So this obviously creates a pretty serious bottleneck uh, in the demographics for the species. Now, this is a long-lived species, so it can potentially deal with this. You just outlive the process, dump more seeds back in, recruit again, and make this, if you don't beat it up too often in this way. The problem that arises is about the time that this guy is recovering, so is spotted knapweed. And so you've got to go in and you've got to deal with some retreatment issues. Uh, and the real, uh, one of the things that we've, we've noted in terms of dealing with this is, is sort of balancing the trade-off between persistence of your herbicide and how often you go back in and retreat. And so this is a paper um, that we published recently in uh, Journal of Applied Ecology. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Crone did some nice work here uh, playing with some modeling uh, of these questions with regard to balsam root. But in general, the scenario is something like this. If I have an herbicide with a persistence time of, say, about three or four years, say it has four years persistence time, and I have to go back and retreat every six years, balsam root is not going to stay in that system. Right? We're going to push it out. If I have an herbicide with a persistence of a year or two, and I can get away with not treating until year six or seven, maybe I could keep balsam root in and other similar species and push knapweed out. Right? So understanding these side effects, these weaknesses, the more we understand these, the more we can sort of alter our tools and do a better job, get more surgically precise with using these things. Now in any case, we're always going to have some side effects on, on forbs. And there's, in general, at the community level, you're going to tend to push away from forbs, you're going to tend to suppress forbs, you're going to alter the trajectory away from forbs and towards grasses if you're not careful. Now, if there's only native grasses on the site, this might be okay depending upon your management objectives. For instance, if you're trying to protect uh, a wilderness era, area by treating a trailhead, and you treat it every year and you hammer all the native forbs out, but you take out all the exotics as well, um, and you have native grasses there, that might be a fine objective for that area if you're, if you're protecting an area behind it. Now, you don't want to do that over um, all the west, clearly, because forbs, again, are 80% of your diversity. So it depends a part on your, on your management objectives. Now, if you have uh, an exotic annual in the system like cheatgrass, which we do, things get much more complicated because it can respond much more quickly than the, than the native grasses. And so let's just look at these community level effects and think about this for a sec. Okay, so here are some uh, data from a uh, pyclorum treatment. This is three years post-treatment, uh, and the treatment is for spotted knapweed, and so we have percent cover of the, uh, the various species here. So over here on the right, you can see spotted knapweed uh, the treated is in black and the control is in light. So spotted knapweed was knocked way back. In fact, three years after treatment, it's still looking pretty good there. It's pretty low levels. Uh, and these were pretty high uh, abundances of spotted knapweed to start with. Okay, so we had good treatment effect. If we bounce over here to PG, which is perennial grasses, you can see that the perennial grasses have been released a little bit. Um, so this is good. We've increased our perennial grasses over the control. If we look at annual forbs here, all right, a little bit of a suppression of the annual forbs, but not too bad. Uh, if we look at the perennial forbs over here, that's a little tougher. We've knocked them back by about 50%, all right? And this is still three years after the fact. 
So, so this is a little tricky, and it's, it's going to be time to start going back in and retreating in the system. But if you're careful about this, in particular, what I've seen, so, so what I see a lot of is helicopter spraying, broadcast spraying in these systems, so you, you blanket the whole area. And, and in general, that may be a good starting point. But if you go back and you repeatedly blanket the area, um, what I usually see with spotted napid in some of these exotics is they come back in these little thick tufts. Um, following treatment. And you could actually go in and focus on those those localized areas. And if you do that with ATV spraying or backpack spraying or whatever, you can minimize the side effects on the rest of the system that's not that's that's more native and less invaded. And as a result you recruit your seed source and you could play you could play a game where you can sort of reduce these side effects right here uh, and and balance out overall, push push on the nap lead harder and be more focused. Maximize your intended effect and minimize your side effects. All right, it gets a little more challenging if you have an exotic in here like cheatgrass, and I've been hiding the cheatgrass data. So here's what cheatgrass does. So cheatgrass really, oh, maybe I'm losing juice here. Uh, cheatgrass really likes this treatment. So you can see cheatgrass increased quite dramatically. Now overall, what we've done in the system is we've reduced our exotic components substantially. We've traded our dominant species in the system, not just dominant exotic, for, from spotted napwood to cheatgrass now. So cheatgrass is the dominant species in the system and um, obviously a problem. So this gets to be much more challenging. If you have cheat cheatgrass or an exotic annual like this present on the site, it's a lot tougher to deal with this. This is just the reality, but this is a tough game. I told you, uh, we developed a conceptual framework for a reason. Um, so the, so the, the thing to think about here is, so this is, this is, a, you know, is, is whether it's better to have cheatgrass than spotted napweed, and these are some of the decisions we have to make. So this is what this looks like. This is a, one of the areas from the study site. So you can see a, we've got a, a sea of cheatgrass here. These tufts in here are um, arrowleaf balsam roots, so those are the adult plants that survive the treatment. Obviously not a very good place for seedlings for recruitment for the plant now with all this cheatgrass in here. Uh, you can see the old stems of, uh, of uh, napweed in here, so this used to be dominated by napweed, but now it's been transitioned over to cheatgrass. Now we all, uh, you know, there's, you could argue back and forth in terms of forage value of the two, um, but when it comes to the fire issue, napweed doesn't burn, and cheatgrass we know uh, can really wreak havoc with fire regimes. We're talking about areas where, where you're going to get forest fires if you get um, these things initiating, uh, uh, fires initiating cheatgrass. So, so whether or not this is uh, a good trade-off is up to your management objectives again, but I would argue that in general it's probably not a very good trade-off. All right, so herbicide, like all of our management tools, has side effects. Um, and that doesn't mean we throw out the tool. What it means, is just like in drugs, um, we don't throw out a drug just because it has side effects. We throw out a few because they're really nasty. And we're <laughs> going to do the same, I'm sure. But the more we learn about the side effects, the more we alter the tools knowing about the side effects, the more effective we can be uh, in this whole process. So, so doing the R&D to, to accomplish this and um, then transferring that information is extremely important. All right, so hopefully what I've done here is given you guys maybe some different thinking. It, if you're already thinking this way, I'd say great. Um, kind of scary if you're thinking like me. But uh, hopefully a different perspective in thinking about some of these, these problems and these challenges. Uh, a sense that when these strong invaders come in, we're not in Kansas anymore. They launch these invasion trajectories. That simply putting a management tool down in the system doesn't get us back to Kansas. Moreover, even if you suppress the target weed, we saw pretty high success with spotted and happy there. Uh, you can still have all kinds of side effects, and overall, you can you can actually make things worse if you're not careful. Um, that doesn't mean we throw out the tools; it means we better understand these things and try and move forward with this. And uh, I think the only other thing I want to say is is uh, everything I cited in here is on our website. You can find the papers there as well as others uh, and other resources. Um, so feel free to go there. And if if the website is not satisfying for some reason, feel free to tell me. Maybe I'll do something about it. particular systems that we've been working in don't. Um, a lot of these are sort of open uh, winter range areas. The, the stuff uh, that we're doing on the Lowland National Forest is actually winter range areas. But a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with, um, no. In general, I think the concepts would apply. Of course, things get more complicated in terms of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
You didn't go into biocontrol, but would you, do you sometimes see serious side effects as serious as the herbicide side effects in biocontrol? Yeah, so one of the side effects I've documented uh, in biocontrol is an increase in hantavirus in the system. So one of the biocontrols introduced for spotted knapweed uh, has become extremely abundant because knapweed is still extremely abundant. Uh, and it's a food source now for lots of things. Deer mice are one of these. And so we've seen deer mouse populations increase two to three-fold and uh, prevalence of hantavirus in their populations increase three-fold. So messing with a zoonotic disease is a pretty serious side effect. Again, doesn't mean you throw out the tool. We need to get more, we need to understand better biocontrols in particular, in the case of biocontrol, efficacy is the key for protecting it against that. We find that you know these complex sort of indirect effects that happen like a, a food web interaction like that, if the biocontrol is successful and takes out the target species, it eats itself out of house and home, reduces the target, reduces its own populations, uh, and deer mice would still eat it, but it really wouldn't matter in terms of their populations. So, so really, you know, again, the more we understand about the side effects, the more we can understand about sharpening the the, the tool and become becoming more surgically precise. That's my hope. Yes, sir. The one graph that you showed um, with the abundance of spotted napoleon on the x-axis, and the abundance of perennial forbs and grasses in the y-axis, you showed a pretty much negative relationship. Mm -hmm. Was that an experimental manipulation, or is that um, resulting from observations of the of these other species. That was, that was observational data there, although we've done some experiments where we've actually taken out, so we've killed knapweed, for instance, around balsam root plants uh, and looked at the response in terms of recruitment of balsam root and impacts on balsam root, but that was observational data. Okay. So that, that brings me to my second question. I was kind of surprised, um, we've got a college in title, and yet, we didn't hear you say much about um, the prospect for cultural control of spotted mapping. It seems like you gave the top of this, this um, pretty convincing graph that there's a negative relationship between sagebrush and, for example, plenty of forbs, which by the way could be the ones that are deep rooted by shrubs, perhaps that existed there hundreds of years ago or something. Uh, and so that makes me wonder, um, are you guys considering cultural methods in the paradigm here? And how would your ideas change? Um, Can, so I guess I'm not sure what you mean by cultural methods. Can you give me an example? Cultural, um, I'm, I'm referring to augmentation of the, or protection of the native, using native plants and native diversity um, as a tool for controlling the spotting method. Pretty much what you emphasize is eradication methods to come in. Well, they're not eradication methods because they don't eradicate, but control methods. But yeah, in terms of in terms of the cultural methods, I guess, I mean, not so much in beforehand um, altering communities beforehand, but definitely I didn't have time to talk about it. But when you look at the herbicide effects, a big problem there is is basically when you have napweed taking up sixty five percent or thirty percent of a community, and you and you take it out with the herbicide, you've got a lot of empty space. And one of the things that I advocate is, is reseeding with native uh, plant seeds. Uh, that's complicated and there's a lot of, it's a very difficult thing to be successful in that regard. But in that regard, using native species to try and re recover these sites, uh, I think it's a very important tool that we need to be uh, using, developing uh, in, in large part. We don't know a lot about it. I don't know if that answers your question. That's as cultural as I've gotten at this point. <laughs>